as well as a wave of hate crimes in recent years across the U.S., makes the work of the SPLC more vital than ever. In this period, when some here and around the world seek to exploit differences and transform them into divisions, it is especially important that we have organizations such as the SPLC who not only provide critical information on such developments, but actively work to counter them and promote a more tolerant, inclusive, mutually responsible world. Alicia Brooks, the SPLC's outreach director, will share fascinating stories about the organization's history, landmark cases, and current work. I am especially proud this year uh, to welcome Alicia Brooks as the 2016 Annual Norman Thomas Memorial Lecture. Prior to that, led to the 
to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which, you know, was pretty momentous and still to this day. It ends in 68 with the assassination of Dr. King and, as I learned, the, the death of uh, Norman Thomas. The space in the middle, which is another thing that I want you to hold on to as, as I share with you today, I am in that space, we call it the open timeline. And it, it, it represents three different things. One, she believes that people fought for social justice prior to 1954 and continue to do so post-68, so it's about that 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 timeline continues, the march continues as we say. Two, the memorial honors 40 individuals who were killed on that timeline, and more than 40 people were killed. But lastly, and probably more, most importantly, it, it holds a space for you and I. So if you were to um, look into the memorial, the water flowing over, you could see yourself reflected back in it. And you're to contemplate what would be said about you, and what would be said about what you did, or what you're doing, to forward the cause of social justice. So think about that as well. Now what we're doing at the Southern Poverty Law Center, quite a lot. Um, those are our founders in the top left-hand corner, Forrest Dees, the more popular one, and Joe Levin on the right. They founded the Southern Poverty Law Center in 1971. Now I like to state the obvious, these were two white men who started the Southern Poverty Law Center. They were born and raised in Montgomery, Alabama during the Jim Crow era. So that's a bit of a miracle right there. They were born and raised in the Jim Crow South, and they went on to found the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is dedicated to advocating for society's most vulnerable people. And at that time, they wanted to continue the legacy of the civil rights of martyrs. Now, they didn't have anything to do with the civil rights movement personally, but they did allow what was happening around them, and in particular in Montgomery, change them, fundamentally change them. So they were raised up, again, in the Jim South, which was a place of, of white supremacy, and they were fully prepared to walk in that path. But when they, um, the Civil Rights Movement beginning uh, with, the, with the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, really kind of changed them. Then, if you look at that with the March on the, the Selma Montgomery March that happened in 1965, that's a full decade of change. And they really wanted to continue that change. They knew that Alabama would not go along with it just because we had a Civil Rights Act, just because we had a Voting Rights Act, just because the country seemed to be moving forward. They knew better that Alabama was going to be moving forward with them. So they decided to start the Civil Rights law firm. And the first cases were against the state. But they wanted to make sure that they continued um, the, the, the goals of the civil rights movement. So they went to, this is Julian Bond at the bottom right. So they went to Julian Bond, who was intimately involved in the civil rights movement. You may know that he was a co-founder of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He was, to date, I believe still to date, the youngest um, person who's ever had their name into, into nomination uh, for Vice President of the United States. He was a Georgia State Legislature who, very much like Norman Thomas, he was a pacifist and social activist, and he won a seat in the Georgia State Legislature, but his colleague refused to see him, or refused to allow him to be seated. So he had to sue and he take to a higher court in, in order to get his seat. That's Julian Bond. He was the first president of the Southern Poverty Law Center and really helped us set, set a direction um, in those early days. And, you know, he passed last year and um, has always been kind of a, a beacon for us. So, back to the early cases of SPLC, we've heard stories, of course, about how um, even after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 bans discrimination based on race, <coughs> Pools and public facilities refused to open up to African Americans. So that was the case certainly in Montgomery. And there were these um, pools, you know, recreation facilities that still refused to allow black children to swim. So Morris decided to sue the, um, the YMCA. And of course, you know, who won. Another early case was um, Morris, Morris read about um, some Vietnamese fishermen who had recently re relocated to Galveston, Texas. 
and clans in there were very threat were threatened by their presence because these Vietnamese fishermen were very good fishermen. And so they decided to, to continue their craft in their new home. Well, the clansmen would get on these boats and, and you see, dressed in, in their robes and stuff and, and intimidate the Vietnamese fishermen. So Morse, Morse read about it and went down to Galveston, talked to the Vietnamese fishermen, and essentially begged them to allow him to bring suit against this group. And we, we did. And the, the clan members had to stand down and their threats against um, the fishermen. But it wasn't until we represented this woman, her name is Beulah Mae Donald, um, her son, Michael Donald, was abducted by two members of a group called the United Clans of America, and they had been operating in Mobile, Alabama. Her son was not an activist, he was just on his way home, randomly selected by these two guys um, at the behest of the clan leader. And they, they abducted him, took him to a remote location, cut his throat, beat him, cut his throat, and then brought him back to the neighborhood where um, the Klansmen lived, which was nearby where the Donalds lived, and hung up in a tree. And left him there and just watched this, this whole scene play out um, out of this front window. So Morris found out about this and was really great and disturbed because he and Joe grew up in Alabama and lynchings were you know, sadly commonplace, but he really thought that that was over. So, to find that it wasn't in 1981, to find that the Klan was lynching someone, it was just too much. So, he decided to sue the Klan in civil court, and this had never been done before. So, it was based, loosely based on uh, RICO organized crime laws, where you hold the leader responsible for the actions of the member. So, what happened was, is that the leader of the Klan organization told those guys to go find a black person. Granted, it was Michael Donald. So we were able to sue the Klan leader in court. The two guys who committed the murder were eventually found guilty in criminal court, but the leader was getting it off. 1987, an all white jury in Mobile finds in favor of Mrs. Donald a $7 million judgment um, against the Klan, which was a, another miracle. Um, so that is what that case is what set the Southern Poverty Law Center on this path of suing um, hate extremist groups in civil court. We've probably had about 15 successful civil suits since the Donald case in '81. One being this was the this was the largest judgment. I should add that the Southern Poverty Law Center is nonprofit. We don't charge our clients to represent them, nor do we share in any of the award money. And also, if you know anything about you know, civil court judgments. People, they rarely get all of the money, right? The, the, our goal is to bankrupt these organizations and make it possible for them to um, kill them again. So a jury, in this case in South Carolina, uh, finds in favor of our client and sues the plan or, or sets a $37.8 million judgment. Of course they don't have the money, but it, it does bankrupt that group and makes it impossible for them to reorganize. And we had a suit in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, just so I, I like to talk about this case because people are under the mistaken impression that hate groups only exist in the south and the southeast, which is not true. There's, there's always been um, a lot of uh, hate extremist activity in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm just telling Dr. Canova that I just returned from Spokane, in, which borders Idaho very near to, to Coeur d'Alene. And they were like, well, why do you think that that is? And, well, you know, you can hide an open site, right? They're very rural, they're very open, and they don't want to like people. So you just don't notice that, that um, some of them are actually um, white supremacists. In this instance, our client was, the client, our client and her son were abducted, not killed, thank goodness. But we were able to sue the Aryan Nation and got a $6 million judgment in this case. This image, which we love, they had a huge, training compound with a lot of property and they used to bring um, newbies to this compound to train them in the ways of uh, white supremacy. They also had children there, they had a quote unquote church there. It was it was just it was a place that you wanted we wanted shut down. So our client got their property in the settlement of the judgment and this is an image of them tearing she had all the building raised because they had all of this you know, swastika uh, and hate um, Similar to this, um, all over the place. So 
as I mentioned, we've probably had about 15 suits, but those lawsuits have not effectively eliminated hatred, so I just want to be real clear about that. It has done a lot to blunt their, their impact, but it hasn't eliminated them. This is a recent picture of a, of a neo-Nazi group exercising their First Amendment rights to protest. And so what we've moved into now, in addition to the civil rights litigation, is to track and monitor these, these groups, these, the activities of these groups. Because, you know, I like this image, because in fact, yeah, it's a hit. Like, you know, they're bringing children into um, the world of hate, and we want to do what we can to mitigate the, the impact of, of what they're doing. Now, some people will certainly see a neo-Nazi group walking down the street and immediately be able to identify them as a hate or extremist group. Some people, though, are, are not able to identify these kind of symbols. This is, uh, this is uh, Westboro Baptist Church in Kansas City. This is the group that, for a couple decades now, has been going to the funerals of, now, going to the funerals of uh, dead service members and saying that they're killed because the United States is, is too soft on um, LGBT folks. I, I like to remind people that, that Fred Phelps and his family of, of haters at West Bureau Baptist Church started their protest um, in, in, during the AIDS crisis. And they would go to the funerals of people that were suspected to have died because of complications due to AIDS. They've been hateful since the beginning. So they are on our hate group list. What we do is um, do an accounting of all the active hate groups in the United States. We wipe the map clean every year, you know, freshen it up every year. This is the, the, the result of 2015. So take in the, the image here. You can see that there are hate groups in virtually every state. I guess you can move to Alaska or, or Hawaii. Um, and there is a high concentration in the southeast. There's also a huge high concentration in the northeast. And always, always has been. I'm originally from California, and there's always, you know, a high number of hate groups there as well. So, the vast majority of groups that we identify as active hate groups are white supremacists and anti-Semitic, but we also identify groups that are um, black separatists, anti-LGBT, any group that has a, a belief or ideology that demeans another group of people based on their immutable characteristics and recruit other people to their way of thinking, we identify as a hate group. They don't have to have committed any crime or, or hate crime or anything, but it's just enough that they exist and want to, have, want to uh, bring other people into their way of thinking. And we'll, the reason why we do this is that we want to, one, just raise awareness about these groups and in hopes to marginalize them and undercut any message that they, that they want to get out there. Now, we've been collecting information since the year 2000. So if we, if we go from 2000 to 2015, that is a 40% increase in the no, number of active hate groups. Now, of course, we've gotten a little bit better in, in our, our accounting, but there's also been a very real increase in the number of active hate groups. You can see that it was on a, on a straight trajectory up until about 2012, and then, it, then it, um, oh, there was a dip. There's always um, an increase in the active hate groups when there's a Democrat in the White House, and no more so than you know in the years of Obama. Now, after his re-election, it kind of took the, the, the wind out of the sails, if you will, and activities kind of, you know, went down a little bit. There was also um, the fact that the country has had some fruitful conversation about immigration, comprehensive immigration reform. That served to bring down the number of active hate groups as well. You can go to our website and look this information up yourself and find out what the hate groups are, where they are, what their ideology is. We also have a state-by-state -state accounting, and as you can see from this, there are 34 active hate groups in Ohio. Now, that's a pretty, a pretty small state to have 34 groups. That's a lot. That's a lot of groups. So, um, if you can, I really encourage you to go, go to the website and find out who your neighbors are, because apparently they're all over the state. 
Now, the, we've identified the number one driver for the increase in actor papers in the United States are the shifting demographics that are taking place in the United States. In 1970, and this is, this is the country nationwide, it looked like this, about 83% white, 17% people of color. Now that turns out to be the most comfortable diversity for people. It's like, it's like the dominant group is still dominant, very dominant, but there's a little bit of diversity and we can say, oh, we're, we have diversity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we have restaurants and, you know, we, have some and stuff. Uh, we might even have some cultural events. But it's changing, and this is really, this is really the figure for 2010, so it's, it's gone up a little bit more. Now when we get to 66% white and 34% people of color, it gets a little bit uncomfortable for folks. Because that's when you start hearing different languages, you see languages in different sign, uh, signs in different languages, and you have um, uh, maybe a voter registration card in different languages, and, and people begin to feel like they're being moved out. Neighborhoods switch over and change and that kind of thing. But this is what the country looks like now. Um, I don't think it looks like that in America, but you're going, you're headed in that direction. <laughs> um, what demographers will tell you is that we're at a kind of a tipping point. I'm sure you've all heard because it's been in the mainstream media now for a few years. White people will no longer be in the majority. Did you hear that? Did you hear the news? Yeah. It's really freaking out by, by a number of people. But the data is what the data is. And first they said, oh, by 2050. But now people are saying maybe 2040, maybe 2035. And this is really um, a creating a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. But the fact of the matter is, is that you can't, you know, you can't change the data. Now. That, this is the way the country's going, um, population growth-wise. Now, the blue, the blue slice of the pie is, is the white population, as you see, still, still safely in the majority, but by the time we get to 2060, they are not. And, more importantly, there's no majority. So it really is an opportunity for us to live up to these high ideals that we that we talk about and figure out how it is that we can work together while no one is in the majority. I want to also point out because when we talk about, I think when we talk about race, at least in Alabama, which I'm sure it happens here as well, when we talk about race and, and, and racial diversity, we still talk about a black, white, high paradigm, I think. And that's just not the case. The black population is very similar to the white population in that it is, is stagnant. It's going to be stagnant for some time. The white population would probably hold that um, an increase of 15%. That's what it was in uh, uh, the year 2000. The black population nationwide is about 12 to 15%, and it will remain that way, and it won't get any higher. If you recall, the, the, the census allowed folks, uh, multiracial, biracial folks, to identify as such in 2010. Those, those uh, people identified biracial and multiracial to the pool for the black white numbers. So that, had, that was the first impact on those numbers. But moving forward, we can see that there are just larger increases in other uh, racial ethnic cultural groups. The Asian Pacific Islander group is the fastest growing immigrant group in the United States. Contrary to popular belief or popular myth, um, Latinos are not the number one group. They're second, but Asian Pacific Islanders are the fastest growing group. And um, it was a 43% increase in Asian and Pacific Islanders, and um, kind of 42 around Latino and Hispanic. So that's, what we're gonna, that's, that's where we're headed. And I, I also like to point out that, that the American Indian uh, population in Native Alaskan is about an 18% increase. So these kinds of um, these kinds of, these facts really are troubling to, to individuals who don't deal with facts very well. You recognize who this guy is? Yes. Okay. This is Dylan Roof. He is the young man who went into the church in Charleston and killed nine black people after um, participating in the prayer meeting with them. Now Dylan, <laughs> Dylan is Dylan is a young person. And um, what happened was, what our intelligence shows, because we've been keeping information on this for some time, Dylan got what we call radicalized online. And we, we often hear this, this term, radicalized online, when we're talking about foreign terrorism. 
The fact of the matter is it happens to what we call domestic terrorists, right? So Dylan, just a disenfranchised white kid, goes onto the website um, in, in just in the immediate aftermath of the Trayvon, Trayvon Martin shooting. He goes on he goes on search of these uh, white supremacist sites. He lands on the site for the uh, Council of Conservative Council of Conservative Citizens. And he reads there that there's a coming race war and that white men in particular need to get ready and move into action. It tells him uh, all of this, these, these, these old lies that you, that you would think have disappeared but have not, that black men are still women and white men have to stand up and we need to do something and we need to raise up and you know push back against um, the uncle and be ready for the uncle race war. So Dylan said, okay, you know, and he did. He did exactly what he read, um, what he was asked to do based on what he read. And um, we see that he also had a fascination with Confederate memorabilia, in particular the Confederate flag. So through the tragedy of that massacre in Charleston, we were able to begin to have a, a real conversation on the Confederate flag and what it meant. And as you know, the, the, the flag was taken down from the State House in Charleston um, just a little while ago. We issued a report, I think a month or two before Dylan Roof uh, set off on this, this murderous path, and it's called the Age of the Lone Wolf. Because what we're finding is, is that even as we're having an increase in the number of active hate groups, we're having also an increase in these people, these individuals that are radicalized online, and we're calling them lone wolves. These are people that are acting independently. So to be clear, Dylan did not belong to a hate group. He read their hate sites, but he did not belong to meetings, join up in any way. He just read everything. So what this report talks about that we shared with law enforcement and with Homeland Security is that, that the very real threat of domestic terrorism is, is increasing. We've documented over 60 um, uh, incidents of domestic terrorism, mostly thwarted, thank goodness, um, that we can tie to these alone wolves. So what we want, what we want um, Homeland Security in particular to do is, as they concentrate on the threat of foreign terrorists, to also remember the threat of domestic terrorists because um, it is very real and people are being killed. Now, in addition to collecting information on active hate groups, we also collect information on what we call radical anti-government groups. You know what this image is from? Recent history. Oregon. 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 Remember what happened in Oregon? Where patriots, so-called patriots, militiamen, took over um, government property, in this instance, a wildlife refuge, and refused to leave. They went in armed and with a dedication to stay there um, in anticipation of a gunfight. They said, we are staying here, we won't leave, we'll die here. That's, that was their opening. And these people, which um, took them to, to, to stress, they were there six weeks. Um, I think we were most people were paying attention to it when it first happened, but it went on for six weeks. Six weeks of armed militia like these people um, held down, held, held back uh, federal law enforcement uh, officials for six weeks. And people came from all over um, the United States to support these people. In fact, they were not from Oregon. And um, the sheriff in Oregon was really quite upset about this because he felt like they took advantage of the situation that was happening there were two two men, a father and son, uh, Ammon, Ammon, Mr. Ammon and his son, who um, were about to turn themselves in for uh, a federal charge. They they had been they had been convicted, found guilty of burning federal lands at ar say ar creating arson or they were guilty of arson of federal land. They were burning um, um, federal fields, and they had received a sentence that on review was deemed too short, so they were given an additional five years. And so they were supposed to turn themselves in. Now the community was having a little protest rally about that, even though the Ammon guys were fully prepared to turn themselves in, and they did turn themselves in. 
the Bundy, the um, Bundy boys, I call them, were were um, uh, taking advantage of that situation and trying to turn it into this major kind of protest that the citizens of Oregon were behind, which they were not. The Ammon said we have nothing to do with the Bundy. We're turning ourselves in. They turn themselves in. They're in prison now. Um, but um, Clive and Bundy um, is the father of the the Bundy boy. I'm forgetting his first name. Who was in charge of this Oregon takeover? Now, if you recall, about a year and a half prior to this Oregon takeover, Clive and Bundy was in Nevada. You remember this? Where um, Bureau of Land Management personnel, federal officials, federal employees again, went to go collect on a bad debt. Bundy, Clive and Bundy, was owed over a million dollars to the federal government for grazing fees. Um, he had his cattle grazing on federal land and felt like he didn't have to pay, even though everyone else did. He didn't have to pay. So when um, the Bureau of Land Management went to collect the money, they raised arms against them and the federal folks who came to, to, to assist. I don't know if you remember this. They were like men on, on freeway overpasses with, with snipers, you know, ready to take out um, law enforcement, federal law enforcement officials. And the thing is, is that nothing ever happened. The federal government just left. Clive Bundy felt like he won. He continued to do what he did. What he, did. he didn't pay his bill. And nothing ever happened. So what we're saying at the Southern Harvey Law Center is that because the federal government didn't move against Clive Bundy in Nevada, it really emboldened the kids, his sons, to do this thing in Oregon. Now, we're pleased that the outcome uh, in Oregon, you remember Clive and Bundy was on his way to see his sons in Oregon, and then he was arrested. So he's been arrested and since indicted on charges relative to the Nevada case. And then the Bundy, the Bundy boys turned themselves in. So there are charges pending for the Nevada takeover and the Oregon takeover. This, we think, um, it's really quite serious, and, and we really want uh, the federal government to pay attention to this threat. Now, in our accounting of radical anti-government groups, which we also began in the year 2000, this is this this has gone up exponentially, over a 500 percent increase since the year 2000. And uh, quite notably, we'll see that it shot up when 2008. <laughs> in uh, the year Obama was elected. And then it went down after his re-election because we're like, oh well. <laughs> Guess there's nothing we can do now. Um, should also note that uh, anti-government groups tend to increase when there's a Democrat in the White House. They'll go down when there's a Republican in the White House and it'll go back up again. But it's never gone up as much as it has during the Obama administration. Now, I would say, and I think that, you know, most colleagues would agree, but there should also, you know, it's a democracy, so there, there should be, and there always will be, some um, anti-government, some distrust of government. There's certainly a lot to be distrustful for. But there's no reason when we have, you know, a high of 13, what, 1,300 um, anti-government groups. We have 998 um, for 2015. And these are very dangerous people. In addition to these uh, patriot groups that, and uh, militia groups that I talked about, a real big part of this anti-government group is sovereign citizen groups. I don't know if you've heard about them. I don't know if you have any problems with them in your community. But these people, sovereign citizens, believe that the federal, federal government has no authority over them whatsoever. And what they'll do is they can bankrupt the town because they will um, bring these, these, these lawsuits against everybody against law enforcement, against the sheriff, against the school district, against all these people. And they're quite dangerous as well. They've been responsible for, for the murders of law enforcement officials. It's been very dangerous for law enforcement officials because they represent the face of government. And um, they have, they have uh, induced them to, 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 to come so they can abduct them and murder them. And some of those, some of those plots have been thwarted, but some law enforcement officers have been killed as a result of it. So, it's something that we, that we need to take very seriously, and we do take very seriously. We started producing what we call these roll call videos. You saw um, a DVD on the, um, on the, the, the 
the law, age of the lone wolf report. We have also done reports on um, or videos for Sovereign Citizens, for the for neo Nazis and Aryan nation or Aryan prison gang. We share these free of charge with law enforcement um, agencies because we want them to be well trained about it. There, there was a uh, a tragic death of uh, two police officers in West Memphis, um, Tennessee, where the sovereign citizen, a, a dad and a 16 year old son, just opened fire um, on um, these police officers and just killed them. And they're, they're as I said, just very dangerous. So we produce a magazine called The Intelligence Report, which I brought some, some copies um, in there at the back table. Each year when we release the hate map, we, we release the issue called the Year of Hate. And so it has the information on all the hate groups and kind of an overview of, of, of the trends and what we think is going on. But in addition to that, throughout the year, the quarterly magazine um, shines a light on other targets of hate. And right now, we see that um, trans, transgender individuals, transgender women of color are a big target for Hate now, in, in addition, this is not tied to, this doesn't come out of the intelligence report, but it's kind of tied in. Um, in, the, in the aftermath of the Bill of Ruth thing, as I mentioned, we, we started this conversation about um, Confederate uh, um, flags and symbols and such. So the Southern Poverty Law Center just yesterday released a report called Whose Heritage, where we documented close to 2,000 um, Confederate flags, memorials, statues, these kinds of things that are on public property. What we wanted to do was to really look at um, these, these, these symbols and figure out where they are and should they be there. We only um, paid attention to those that are on, on government property. We also did an account of schools, schools that are named after Confederate heroes and such. Um, for instance, in Montgomery, we have uh, Robert E. Lee High School and we have uh, Jack Davis High School, and those populations are pretty much black. And um, uh, we found the most Confederate monuments, I believe, was in Georgia, followed closely by Virginia and in North Carolina. Um, this is a mention the report just came out yesterday. And what we're hoping this will do, because after the Bill and Ruth thing, we got a lot of um, requests for for assistance or support in trying to help communities take down um, their Confederate memorials. And uh, we've been accused of trying to erase history, but we're not trying to do that at all. We're just trying to raise awareness and have a, an honest conversation about what these memorials mean, what they stand for, and should they, more importantly, um, be, be supported by public funds when the, the, the fact of the matter is is that um, the, the symbols, we did a little bit of this too, the symbols really grew out of um, the Reconstruction era, right? And um, we saw a resurgence or, or, or an introduction of one of the Confederate battle flags in the immediate aftermath of Reconstruction, the beginning of the Jim Crow era. And then um, we, we see again over history when Confederate flags were raised on state property right at the, at the, in the midst of the Civil Rights Movement. So we see it as a pretty clear symbol of white supremacy and, um, and um, folks', in, folks is, uh, intention not to move forward. So we want to talk about that and talk about, in, in Alabama, they say, you know, they have bumper stickers, hate not heritage, or her we say hate not heritage, they say heritage not hate. But what we want to do is to have a, a more informative discussion about whose heritage that is and what are you talking about really. Um, so look for that report, you can find it online. Additionally, um, in addition to the major lawsuits that we bring about hate groups and such, we have kind of regular everyday practice on, uh, around the a variety of civil rights issues. One practice area is called economic justice. I have a short video clip that I wanted to, to share with you, very brief, but it talks about um, the return of debtors' prisons. Mm -hmm. And this woman, I was brought by police at a little block. And I couldn't afford to pay I was working part time back then and uh, I 
couldn't afford my insurance. That sold out. Uh, yeah, my license. And uh, I got a ticket to go to shoot. I want to pay that. And that's one of my license. And so that is good. And I uh, take it to go to shoot. So I was doing wrong. So I don't have to spend it. But I had to get to work. I had to go pick my phone. I had to take them to the back and forth in the stores. And that's how I ended up in my trouble with those roadblocks. I also was set up within a half a mile from my house. I was set up for the face to face yes to the courts. I had to do $40 a month. And $40 was going to be paid to yes and $100 was going to be my car. If you could not afford to pay the whole $140 for that month, you had to do it every week. It was hard. Because I didn't like going and I didn't have the money and it was so embarrassing doing that. You know, at night, not, I lost my car trying to pay this. I did a title bomb on my car. I lost that. And trying to pay them to the field, you know, they hit each other all here and there. So I wanted to pay my car. But I come to it, so like I said, it just hurt my heart. I didn't fail that case, but I had to pay it off. Did it go to the point? I just got that. I had to take anything that wasn't. That was like, you know, I paid $2,000 one time. I got me a ticket And uh, that was in February. And I bought it. I was going to have to take it. So I stopped taking anything. I told them that I wouldn't get up so I gave you that. Well, I don't understand, like I said, I didn't know that there was a private company. I thought it was going to be a good So I was just really lost the whole lot of things came in. They could go into my family. Yeah, I don't Sorry that you weren't able to hear it um, clearly, but essentially what, what, what's happening is, is that we're seeing what we call a return to the debtor's prison, where people are being sent to jail for an inability to pay their fines. One, I mean, that's problematic because one, it's unconstitutional to imprison anyone because they can't pay their fines. And these, and these courts know that. Two, we, we find that it's, it criminalizes people that are living in poverty. poverty. It's just unfair. One, cities, if you've ever gotten a ticket, um, and I see, I can get a ticket, and I can look at it and be upset and angry and pay my ticket. Not everybody can do that. Um, and if you look at a parking ticket, you'll find that the, the, the actual fine for the parking ticket is very small, typically very small. But what's loaded on top of that are court costs and uh, government costs. So what we're doing is funding city services on the backs of poor people. Uh, oft, as often happens, you may have heard this um, as it related to um, Ferguson. Um, cities will send law enforcement people out, they'll set up these roadblocks in poor areas and essentially trap people, and that's what happened to Mrs. Cleveland. So she said, by her own admission, she, she was driving um, uh, uh, without a license, and so 
she got a ticket and she could not pay it. To complicate matters further, um, she had to go through this private probation company, Judicial Services um, Corporation, which makes themselves sound like they're an official entity, and they are not. They have a contract with the city to collect on unpaid fines. Once that company decides that you're a bad risk or you're not, chances are you don't, you're not going to pay me. As, as happened with Ms. Cleveland, they got as much out of her as they could, which, I should mention, you have to pay, people have to pay to sign up with this company. Then they have to, to, to pay the company a percentage of their fine. And so what happened was is that she took all she had and then she ran out. And so JCS said, okay, we'll go pick her up because she can't go, you know, we can't get any more money on her. And then we end up housing someone in jail for 10 days for not being able to pay their fine. What does that do to the job that, that she had? She also went into further debt, trying to take out one of these um, you know, payday loans and, and all of that. So what happens with poor people is they get caught in a, just a ever never ending spiral of debt. And we say that that's wrong. So um, companies or cities have to find a way for people to be able to do community service or pay. I know it's time, sorry. Um, so that's very, very important. We have an LGBT rights group, which we just had this recent victory against a group, excuse me, in New Jersey, that uh, had this company that, that says that you know you can make any people straight. You may have heard this this lie. It's not true. We sued them on the basis of fraud and uh, shut them down. And I had another video to show you, but I can't show you. Um, and we have an immigrant justice practice area where we primarily represent the uh, uh, guest workers, people that have a guest worker visa. And in this instance, our clients were cheated out of uh, wages and also forced to live in these squalid, you know, unsanitary conditions. These people, they, this company brought them from India and forced them to live in this double wide trailer so they had to pay eleven hundred dollars a month to live with six other guys in this trailer. And they went from the work from the trailers to the work site and back. We call that an end slavery and indentured servitude. We're able to sue the company and they got fourteen million dollars. We have uh, a practice area that looks at mass incarceration. In case you didn't haven't heard of the United States uh, incarcerates more people than anybody on the planet. Anybody. We take a particular interest in looking at mass incarceration as it pertains to juveniles, because I think when we talk about mass incarceration, people are often talking about adults. We're very concerned about adults, but we're also concerned about children. We're also concerned about children not being tried as adults. What you may not know that there are over 10,000 kids right now, children, that are, that are serving in adult facilities, which makes them subjected to sexual assault, um, depression, they're put in solitary confinement because these adult facilities can't protect them physically. And it's a terrible, terrible thing to do to a child. Um, our, our third program area is teaching tolerance, where we provide free resources to educators across the country. Moore started teaching tolerance in 91 because he wanted to reach kids and give them, give them a message of, of um, celebration or support for difference before they became susceptible to messages of hate. So what we do in this magazine is provide teachers with um, information to help them be better, um, better serve their, their, their students. Because, you know, teachers are, are wonderful, and I was a former teacher, but we don't always know kind of the ins and outs of culture. In California, I don't know what it is in Ohio, but in California, you only have to take one class of multicultural education, which covers everything. So we try to give them information that will help them serve an increasingly diverse student population. We have documentary films. Our most recent film is Selma, the Bridge to the Ballot. that talks about the Selma and the <coughs> March. And these are all free. Lastly, we just released this, the Trump Effect. <laughs> Um, we surveyed teachers and teach, the subscribers to teaching college, about 2,000 teachers took part in the survey, and the results were just awful. Um, teachers reported students being bullied and harassed. Um, teachers reporting the name Trump being used as some kind of uh, uh, epithet, like a, 
bad word, like, you know, um, maybe being used to intimidate children, children being told that they were going to be sent back, even black children, you're going to be sent back, you know, when, and I don't know if you support, but I'm just telling you what the, what the, the, the rhetoric around this campaign is creating a climate of fear in our nation's classrooms. Kids thinking that there, there's a wall where you go, that they're going to be shipped back to wherever, and um, teachers are perplexed about what to do about it. Um, lastly, we have a program that we just started called SPLC on Campus that in, in, in light of the, what we see as a really good resurgence in student activism on college campuses, we want to support that by giving, providing information and resources to um, students to help them fight hate and bigotry on, on college campuses and throughout their communities. And that's it. Sorry, I rushed to the last part, but it brings us back to our first slide and my charge to you. Remember, so justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you. Some old 
for a bit some overlap, of course. Um, but yeah, it is fueled by the most radical anti-government um, people. And to be clear about it, it's against the federal government, right? But typically, um, people who really believe in, in the uh, who really support the anti-government movement only support local um, authority, say the sheriff, and that's about it. So those are true in here. But in Texas, you know, that's that's Texas. So. <laughs> but you know, the, you know, of course, they, they're not going to give up the, the federal benefits. They're not going anywhere. Hi, you spoke to Trump and the children of America. What is the organization seeing as far as the adults and the hate groups mm. currently with the campaign? Well, well. When we released the um, 2015 report, we, sh we we noted that, and it's not just Trump, so I don't want to just completely confine this to Trump, but when, when Trump came out, um, he's the one that first started to talk about the wall. And then he started talking about uh, his anti-Muslim kind of rhetoric, right? And then other candidates begin to pick up that, pick up on that theme. And what we found is, is that through his campaign, he has made it possible for these, this, 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 this hateful rhetoric to penetrate, penetrate the mainstream in ways that it never has before. And for it to be okay, right? Um, people, it seems that people, they can say anything and there's no, there are no consequences for it. Things that you would never, you would never allow to be kind of in print or in mainstream, um, um, media, on the TV or whatever, people can just apparently say anything. So it's it's picked up. And you see, you can see this at rallies, we've noticed this of course, where you, you find more kind of people, armed people, you find more people with Confederate flags, you'll find uh, more, you know, kind of a, a re revitalization of this anti-Obama um, hate that was, that was uh, present in some Tea Party. Um, so, yeah, it's it's there. Um, we find, if you follow, we, we have a, a blog called The Hate Watch, and this has been in mainstream uh, media as well. But Trump, he, he, he'll, he'll take, he's, he's big on social media, but he'll retweet, I mean, white supremacist groups follow him, love him, David Duke talks about him, he can get, he can be, um, receive support from a, from a, from a recognized hate group, and not have any consequence about it, and feel proud about it, and send retweet those messages out to his followers. So it's it's completely clear that he has the support of organized hate groups, and um, it seems to be okay. It doesn't it doesn't doesn't seem to affect the, the the conversation at all, which is the most amazing thing. So all we can do is to continue to. Um, bring attention to it. We want people to know, okay, you think that's okay, but we're telling you, this guy who supports this guy uh, belongs to a hate group. Just to be fair, we also um, um, did, did some outing with um, uh, Senator Cruz, who identified one of his, his top foreign advisor is um, a big Islamophobe. Um, and so we tried to bring attention to that. And then just last week, Cruz refused to meet with anybody from um, the Islamic community, you know, in, in New York, where he was, I don't know who was New York, it was the state that he was campaigning in. He refused to meet with any Muslims. I mean, so we try to bring attention to all that and the, the players that are on the outside trying to influence, influence the candidate.
actually had no idea how much the Trump stuff uh, influenced younger people. Um, I work at a diner in my um, town, and there was uh, actually a girl, she was younger than me, and she got upset at for me because um, she said that I had added her tab wrong, and at the end she told me, she's like, well, you know what, you should enjoy this job while you have it, because after Trump is elected, um, they'll, they'll be sending dirty Mexicans like you back. Um, and it's funny, because I'm actually not Mexican, so I mean, I don't really pay attention to that. But it was, it was just interesting, because she was, she was 12, and I was like, okay. Wow. Um, but wow. I had no idea how, um, how much it influenced younger people as wow. well. And um, she's not the only one. There's a group there, uh, Trump supporters, and I get to hear their lovely conversations about Trump and um, how like minorities and stuff are um, going to be gone soon. Mm -hmm. So, but it, it's just interesting how um, like a lot of younger people they they just hear that's right, and they don't exactly understand. They understand that it's they can use it as a weapon. They understand that. They understand that something's going to happen to the you know the colored people. They understand that. Um, and let's be clear, they're not they're not deriving their understanding from watching you know uh, the political scene themselves. They're they're hearing it or overhearing it from the adults in their life. You know the adults in their home that as they're watching the television and kind of saying these bigoted and biased things, the kids will pick it up and then take it to the school. I'm so sorry, uh, I'm so sorry that that happened. I'm so sorry to hear like a 12 year old that just felt empowered to be able to to say that. I mean, God, what could that kid have been exposed to that allowed them to say that? You know what I mean? That, that, that's the scarier thing too. Like to me, Trump is Trump. But the fact that like everybody else is, like picking up on this, it just it makes me very, very sad. Or, and just the whole stupidity, nobody's going anywhere. Do people not know that? Do people not understand? <laughs> it's ridiculous. But people believe it. And the fact that you want, that people want to believe it, want to believe it's true, and will think that they can get together and make it true, is a very scary thing. That's what makes me want to go live someplace else, right? You hate me that much? Like you were gonna do all you can to, to I don't know, make America great again. I'm sorry. I don't. I mean, you know, we we don't. I'm not. Even though he's on the cover, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we're we're nonpartisan. If, if, if we do critique each of the candidates and whatever it is that they have to say, he just gives you a lot of ammunition. So, as a parent of um, adolescent children, I, I live in a community neighboring Marion County who, within the last decade, has actually had a cross burn in the yard of um, a black family that attends Fairville School. Did you say within the year? Within the last decade. Oh. Within the last decade. Um, yeah. And my home is very, very friendly. We, we're not diverse, but we want to strive for that. But how, how can we help our children? to understand the need for diversity and for tolerance um, when they're surrounded by these, by Trump on television, by social media. The, the school that, that my children attend, um, it is not uncommon, in fact it's very common, to go in and see the Confederate flag flying off of pickup trucks. They actually have to make it a rule of the school that you may not fly the Confederate flag. Actually, any flag on the back of the truck, because when they specify the Confederate, then it's a problem. Any flag on the back of your pickup truck. How, how do we battle? How do you fight those battles? Well, it sounds like you, you are. Um, you're aware of it, you're concerned about it. I would say if you're in a community that doesn't have a, its, its own natural diversity and you have children, then you have to take them someplace, like expose them to cultural events and make that be okay. Go, you go, your whole family go, and y'all be the the minority in the group, right? And and your children will pick that up as, as something that's important. That's what I try to do with my son. Now, I'm a real big performer. It's another one of those things that's on us. If we want to have integrated communities, we have to create integrated communities. We don't have a lack of diversity in specific areas because there's a lack of diversity. We saw the demographic. 
because that's how we choose to live. We have the purpose to live intentionally integrated lives or it won't happen, right? Schools and, and neighborhoods, well, schools anyway, are more integrated, segregated now than they were like in post-Brown in 1970. Residential segregation is, 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 is hyper, you know, and people are segregated by race and by class. And so we have to do something to change that ourselves, right? We, um, Dr. Genoa, we, we had a lovely drive-in from where you And we went by the river, and you know, I, I, I lost count of all the gated communities that, you know, I passed by. They were all lovely. It's all beautiful. It's beautiful. But oh my gosh, if, if that's what we're going to decide, that's how we're going to live, that's what, that's what we're going to do, then we're going to have, we're going to have segregated communities. And if we do have segregated communities, then it's a little harder, not impossible, but you have to go expose your children to, to diverse experiences. And then when you're there, talk to them about it. When you're coming back, they might be like, why, why, why are you going to this black church? You know, like, okay, you tell them. And then they understand that you appreciate these things and you want to expose them to these things. And you recognize that they don't have diversity in their life. Whatever. You know, this could be an ongoing kind of fun family thing. That's what you could do. And you could, you could be the voice of reason at your school for um, articulating why you don't think it's a good idea to have, you know, the better flag waving. Whatever. You could bring cultural events to your school without having cultural representation there because you believe uh, that something's important, maybe Kwanzaa, I don't know, whatever it is you want to celebrate or honor. You know what I mean? You could just have to do it yourself. It's harder, but you can do it. I think it's lunchtime. He's going to be Did you want to ask something? I think he's really the last hand, though. Uh, yeah. So just I'll try to be quick. Um, how much group or work does your organization do with um, regarding the proportionality of financial punishment. Um, to give an example, say you know I get a $150 speed ticket. Oh. My ability to pay versus somebody else's ability to pay is different. How much work does your group do with trying to get municipalities and you know, governments to recognize the proportionality of None, none really. We don't do that. That's another. That's a kind of a, another voters issue. We might work with our local poverty advocacy group to support them in their efforts to do that, and then it would be an education campaign. Kind of. We're just trying to bring attention right now to how uh, people from poverty are criminalized. So, if we can get if we can get people to understand that in a place where there's high poverty and they don't get it, well, we're all poor. Well, you pay. I pay my ticket. You pay. You know. They don't, it's an education. And the step that you're at is kind of way down the road. So I like it. Isn't that Finland or somebody that does that where I'm not sure. really rich people have to pay like tickets like a hundred thousand dollars or something? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.